In the last month, I've posted two videos about the foundation problems associated with the Millennium Tower in San Francisco, and these videos have gotten a great response on the channel. I'm posting this new update video because I recently discovered a great source for many of the project-related structural and geotechnical reports and other documents, as well as the recent remediation efforts. Researching this information has answered many questions that I've had about how this debacle with the excess foundation settlement and building tilt came to pass. This information also illustrates that there were so many missed opportunities to get this foundation right for this building. I'll share what I've learned with you today and I think it makes for a very compelling story. So if you're new to this channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. My name is Casey Jones. I've worked as a geotechnical engineer for the last 36 years, and I've had experience with lots of interesting geotechnical projects over the years, which helps me bring a different perspective to these types of stories. I discovered these sources of additional information about the Millennium Tower project through a link from a Reddit post that led me to a web page that contained these documents. This web page is attributed to the University of California Berkeley professor and geotechnical engineer, Lawrence Karp. Six decades working in San Francisco, soils engineer Lawrence Karp says he has never seen anything quite like the Millennium Tower quagmire. And he titles this web page, Millennium Tower Debacle, San Francisco. I've put a link to this web page in the description for this video. Professor Karp will figure prominently in this story as you'll see. The other engineer who will be key to the story is Ron Hamburger, who is with the engineering consulting firm Simpson, Gupperts, and Hager. They designed the measures that were used in an attempt to remediate the foundation settlement in building tilt. You see, Professor Karp, along with structural engineer Joshua Carden, wrote a letter to the City and County of San Francisco Board of Supervisors dated July 10th, 2019, three years after the excessive foundation settlement and building tilt became public knowledge. I think their letter is rather extraordinary. First of all, they were not paid for providing this letter and they had no financial interest in this project. Instead, they were so concerned about the possibility that the city would implement what they considered to be the wrong approach to the foundation remediation that they stated that they issued this letter as a public service. In summary, there were two types of foundation remediation proposals that were being considered at that time. The first plan involved installing over 200 micropile through the building slab connected to the underlying bedrock at depths over 200 feet below the ground surface. In their letter, Carp and Carden referred to this option as the internal symmetrical plan, and it was this plan that they thought should be used. The second option under consideration by the developer and building officials was to install a total of 52 piles to bedrock that were connected to the outside of the building foundation. Carp and Carden referred to this option as the external asymmetrical plan. In their letter, they were strongly against this second option, which turned out to be the one pursued by the developer and building officials. These engineers' objections to the exterior asymmetrical plan were based on their prediction that foundation settlement and tilt would accelerate due to soil removal from piling installation and associated dewatering, and this is exactly what happened two years later when the remediation work was started. They also stated that having an asymmetrical foundation support system would be particularly problematic during loading imposed by a large earthquake. They predicted that ultimately the foundation would break diagonally with no possibility for further repair. They believed that many of the connections between the pile tops and the foundation slab had already broken due to the existing differential foundation settlement, which they predicted would only get worse over time. They also stated that with the asymmetrical external piling plan, that there were likely to be significant cost overruns. And we know now this turned out to be exactly the case. The projected $150 million cost for this external plan ballooned to $150 million and was delayed by several months. In fact, the unit owners got a bill from the developer to try and recoup $6.8 million of these cost overruns. Interestingly, the internal symmetrical plan was estimated to cost about the same as the original estimate for the other repair option, but apparently it was not approved due to concerns of some of the lawyers that were involved with the negotiations at that time. Professor Karp said that he heard nothing more from building officials or anyone involved with the Millennium Tower project after he had sent his letter. I think this solution that's being built now is not working. It was doomed from the beginning. Writing this report was like shooting fish in a barrel for people that know what they're doing. But today the engineers tell us they don't know if anyone ever read it. We never were contacted by anybody at the city anyway, were you? Uh, no, no, the city left it up to the building department. In fact, during this interview, which was done when the remediation work had to be suspended due to increased foundation settlement and building tilt, I applaud the efforts of Carp and Carden in writing this letter and for being willing to publicly state their concerns about the Millennium Tower project. However, there's another lesson here that I sometimes have to remind myself of as I've seen this phenomenon many times. Sometimes as an engineering consultant, it's common to want to go above and beyond in trying to serve a client by giving them really good technical advice based on your experience 
for no additional charge, and such advice is really beyond the scope of your original services. However, in such cases, your client will typically not respect those opinions unless they are paying a lot of money for them. In other words, the client is not invested in getting this extra free advice. I think that this phenomenon could have been at play relative to the letter issued by Carp and Carden. There's also that biblical quote that says you shouldn't cast pearls before swine. So in summary, Carp and Carden have been right consistently about what would happen if the external remediation plan were pursued instead of the internal remediation plan. Now let's contrast that with engineer Ron Hamburger who was in charge of the design for the external remediation plan that was used. Clearly he had not anticipated the effects that the installation of these external piling would have on increasing foundation settlement and building tilt. In fact, an accelerated rate of foundation settlement and building tilt was noted during the very first week of repair work in April 2021. At that time, Hamburger said that the movement was consistent with that occurring prior to the remediation work, which turned out to clearly not be the case. As they proceeded with their work, the accelerated rate of movement continued and the remediation work was halted just four months later in order to perform more studies. This review resulted in a reduction of the number of perimeter piling from 52 to 18 and the implementation of an extensive foundation monitoring plan. An engineering news record article at the time mentioned that seven inches of the total 30 inches of lateral displacement at the top floor of the building caused by building tilt had occurred during the installation of the perimeter piling. The ENR article also had the following quote from Ron Hamburger. We did not anticipate that pile installation would cause additional movement, but we were proactive about it. Do you think having to suspend construction and reducing the number of piling that were originally planned is being proactive or reactive. How could they have not considered that the repair efforts would likely cause more problems with foundation settlement and building tilt, especially when Professor Karp clearly spelled it out for them two years earlier. Ron Hamburger also said that following repair efforts, the building tilt would decrease significantly, which hasn't happened yet. So at this point, do you think the building is really just an engineering experiment and only careful and continuous monitoring will indicate the future outcome for this building and its residents? Or do you think that these measures are simply a band-aid, which is postponing the inevitable decision to condemn this building, move people out, and take the building down? These problems associated with foundation settlement and building tilt are a result of the inadequate foundation used for the original construction. After reading these original geotechnical design reports, it appears to me that this was a mistake that could have and should have been easily avoided. I examined to what extent the original geotechnical firm, Treadwell and Rollo, had presented their basis for the estimated total building settlement of four to six inches over the lifespan of the building, instead of the 18 plus inches of settlement that occurred just a few years following construction of this building. I wondered if this error was related to inadequate subsurface investigations and associated laboratory testing. I also wondered if the designers had considered the effects of dewatering on the rate and magnitude of foundation settlement. I would say that I think that the amount of laboratory testing that included consolidation testing of thin wall samples was on the low side, but I do think there was enough information that had been collected that would have and should have resulted in a better prediction of total and differential settlement of the foundation. Also, there are only two borings on the site that advanced through the bulk of the Old Bay clay deposits that contributed to the bulk of the settlement associated with this building. The geotechnical report also addressed the potential for foundation settlement due to construction dewatering, but didn't state how much that would add to the total predicted settlement. Instead, they suggested that the impacts of dewatering should be carefully monitored by the contractor. They did mention the potential associated with increased settlement of the foundation with reduced groundwater levels from adjacent construction activity, but there were no estimates of the additional amount of settlement that could occur. The bottom line to me is that there was no clear-cut methodology presented in the Treadwell and Rollo geotechnical reports to support their estimated total foundation settlement amounts of four to six inches over the lifetime of the building. Frankly, I've seen more comprehensive analysis for the basis of key geotechnical foundation considerations presented in the reports used to build small retail stores, let alone a 600 foot tall reinforced concrete residential building. Keep in mind that just before these geotechnical investigation and design reports were issued by Treadwell and Rollo, they had also been involved with the foundation design for a nearly identical 52 story building that was also to be founded on relatively shallow pile that did not extend through the Old Bay clay to bedrock. However, this project, which was located at 80 Natoma Street, was not approved for construction because an independent geotechnical engineer, Chuck Ladd of MIT, reviewed the foundation design and concluded that the total and differential settlements would be unacceptably high, in excess of 11 inches. Building officials' review and rejection of their foundation design for the 80 Natoma building was completed just a few months before Treadwell and Rollo issued their final geotechnical report for the Millennium Tower project. So why did no one with the building department, the developer, or the geotechnical design engineer connect the dots that the Millennium Tower project would also have too much foundation settlement? 
It turns out that unlike the AD Natomas Foundation design, the Millennium Tower project developers did not want to have an independent design review of the foundation, as they said that would delay the project by years. City officials agreed with the developer and granted a construction permit without having this third-party engineering review performed. You know, in my experience as a geotechnical engineer, such reviews can be done in a matter of several weeks or a few months. Second, why did the city officials agree to the omission of this review? It's also interesting to me that in the geotechnical design report prepared by Treadwell and Rollo for the 350 mission site, which is just across the street from Millennium Tower, they mentioned that there was an existing four-story building that would have to be torn down to make way for construction of the project. This building was built in 1922 and consisted of 700 timber piles that were 12 and 3 quarter inches in diameter. From the information presented in the report, it can be inferred that these uh, pile extended depths of approximately 50 feet below grade which is only about 30 feet shallower than the thousand or so 14 inch square concrete pile that were used for the Millennium Tower project, which is 58 stories, not four stories. So in other words, the foundation for the Millennium Tower was not drastically different than the foundation for the nearly 100 year old four story building near the site. As I've mentioned in previous videos, I've seen that an apparent lack of institutional knowledge can cause problems with the design and construction of deep foundation projects. In this case, where was the institutional knowledge about what types of foundations had been used or not used for similar projects for the past 100 years or so in San Francisco, relative to the foundation loads that would be applied by the 58 story Millennium Tower building? I've seen the same issue associated with the design and installation of piling for bridge projects, where the actual driven depth of the piling was either much shallower or much deeper than that based on the depth for the original plan length. Oftentimes these situations occurred in exactly the same way as a nearby project, maybe just a few years before, but somehow this information wasn't being collected and presented so that the designers could learn from their past issues. So in essence, nobody was making this historical information available for use in the design and construction of future projects. As an engineer who performs construction phase dynamic pile testing, I decided to create a data service for creating data visualizations and analytics based upon this historical PDA data. I have a video about how such a tool could save money and avoid a lot of problems during construction if you want to check it out. So again, why didn't the rejection of the 80 Natomas building construction permit that was proposed at a nearby site with similar foundation soils and similar building heights and loadings not raise questions about the viability of the foundation design for the Millennium Tower building. In 2009, at the end of construction for the Millennium Tower, Treadwell and Rollo noted the maximum settlement of the foundation had exceeded eight inches, which they attributed to a longer than planned dewatering duration at the site. Again, this eight inches of settlement is in contrast to the four to six inches of total settlement predicted over decades for the project. Also in 2009, there appeared to be no effort to significantly raise their estimate of total foundation settlement in the future, or to consider potential impacts associated with construction phase dewatering at adjacent building sites relative to the settlement amount. Also, they appeared to have missed an opportunity to realize that their original settlement computations were erroneous. An interesting sidebar to this story is that Treadwell and Rollo was acquired by Langen in 2010. I wonder how much Langen knew about the potential for excessive foundation settlement and building tilt when they acquired Treadwell and Rollo in 2010. I wonder if they contacted a professional liability insurer at the time to notify them of a circumstance. A circumstance is an issue associated with a project where the engineer that has performed this service might have a claim against their professional liability insurance. Now, I'm not suggesting there was any key information that was concealed during this acquisition of Treadwell and Rollo, but I am wondering what type of due diligence was done to view the potential liability associated with some of their larger and more significant projects. For those of you who work for engineering firms that have acquired other engineering firms, did you do a review of their key geotechnical design reports for large projects? So let's circle back to engineer Ron Hamburger, who is the lead designer of the recently completed foundation remediation plan for Millennium Tower. He and his firm are working for the Condo Association. He's been described by some in the media as being eternally optimistic about the future performance of the foundation for this building. However, some of his key statements that were made at various points of this project have been demonstrated to be clearly incorrect. To some people, this makes Hamburger's claim that the Millennium Tower is now safer than ever in the event of an earthquake, frankly, hard to believe. Now contrast that with Carp and Carden, who had no financial interest in this project, who have been consistently proven correct about their predictions of problems associated with foundation performance. Only ongoing monitoring will determine whether additional foundation settlement and building tilt will occur. But this leaves the question about how well the foundation slab can withstand the asymmetric loading that is being imposed on it. The other key question is how well will this foundation and building perform when, not if, a major earthquake occurs? What happens if additional remediation measures are needed? Where will the money come from to do it? Will the owners of the units be expected to pay even more money than what they've recently had to pay out to address a portion of the cost overruns? Doesn't it seem that with everything at stake for the future of this building and its residents, 
that an independent engineering review team be brought in to assess the future foundation performance. Such a team could consist of both geotechnical and structural engineers hired by the state or local governments who have no prior involvement or ties with the developer or condo association. After all, there's a wealth of technical data that's been generated for this project, and it wouldn't take much time or money for a high-level review to be performed. Again, I think it's too soon to say how this is all going to turn out. So please let me know your thoughts in the comments section, and please stay tuned for future videos. Thanks very much.